Now, <laughs> to the man of the hour. Man we are joined by author and all-around wonderful guy, Daryl Janney. This is his book. The book is called 19. He's working on his second book, which through a lot of deliberation, he came up with the brilliant title, <laughs> 20. You see where we're going here. It's not like, you know, 19, 29, 30. No, he's going to get it all the way up to 100. <laughs> but he wrote a book. This is a come-of-age book about a guy who was born and raised in a pretty religious family in, uh, in uh, Illinois, and he had a dream. He wanted to go to college. He wanted a little bit more. So he essentially packs up everything he has, moves to the big city, and he tries to break into uh, the modeling business. And as he points out in the book, only 5% of those in the modeling business can actually make a living at it. But this is a really compelling story about his life, about how, what the struggles were involved, how he ended up in Italy and at the highest level. And you'll see some of the pictures. We're going to roll the tape on some of these uh, different uh, magazine covers he was on. But enough about that. Let's go straight to the uh, horse's mouth, as it were. But before we get into this book, which, by the way, is just a great book. Thank you. What happened to your neck, and why <laughs> are you wearing this brace? Uh, well, about three weeks ago uh, in North Carolina, we were boogie boarding, and I sort of caught a wave that was bigger than I thought and got underneath it. So the wave lifted me up and then dumped me you know, head first into the into the bottom, basically, and uh, it was kind of a freak accident. Um, I knew sort of what had happened at, at that at that moment. It was at the end of the day; the tide was coming in, um, and the water wasn't that deep. It was only about four feet deep, but uh, the impact um, and then the weight of the wave uh, compressed my vertebrae. Uh, you know, I, my head stayed and my body went the other way. So I damaged my spinal cord and was uh, actually paralyzed from the neck down in the water. <laughs> so I have to say that was kind of a, uh, you know, kind of one of those moments where, you know, I, I definitely thought it was my time. And uh, so you're, you're conscious. Conscious, yeah. But which you was can't a, that move was amazing. Couldn't. And yeah. you're under the water. Yeah. Now, you and the love of your life decided to have seven children, right? right? You're the father of seven children. Yeah. And at this time, it seems like it was a good idea to it have seven <laughs> kids because who came and retrieved? Well, my, my, uh, my son, Nicholas, who's uh, now the same height as I am, he doesn't weigh as much as I do, but he was, uh, he was out there with me and he had no idea what had happened. And uh, I, I was able to look for some reason, I could see underneath the water, which I usually can't see in the salt water, so there must have been something going on to help me make it through this. And uh, he, he didn't really even know that I was there. You know, he, I saw him sort of looking away, and I'm underwater. So I said, you know, if I try to yell underwater, we've done experiments with that. The kids all want to, can you hear me? Like you're under the pool. If I you can't hear yeah. anything. And I oh. said, if I do that underwater, nothing's going to happen. I said, maybe I'm going to get my head turned a little bit because I spotted him. And uh, maybe it, something happened where the waves sort of pushed me and my head was just above water, like not even... And you literally can't move. Splits, I can't move anything, yeah. And I just got, I got like a help. You know, I didn't even get the full help. And then I saw him look over at me and he's like, oh, crap. And he immediately rushed to me and pulled me out. You know, I was back down in the water as soon and as And he I, stabilized your neck and your back until... Well, no. He didn't really know what had happened. He just sort of got me to the shore. Uh -huh. And then once we got... To, he got me as far as he could. And then some guys helped, uh, the, some surfers that were there, wow. and um, pulled me up there. And I was, you know, basically... <laughs> you know, thinking, well, that's one problem solved. At least I'm not drowned and paralyzed. So got onto the beach, uh, and then I told him, well, I think you guys should move me a little further up the beach because the waves were coming in. And then a wave completely But meanwhile, went. you can't move no, your arms, can't you move. can't move your legs, no. you're just going, hey. No. Once they got me up further, I started to feel my right arm, and then I immediately tried to lift it, and it was kind of like, you know, it basically flopped on top of me. Oh my God. And then they were panicked that don't move, don't move, you know, and, and you know, someone was holding my head. and. Uh, you know, my concern was, uh, my son was there. He was kind of upset. He was looking over, so. So how many of the seven kids did you have on this particular it was just, vacation? It just Nicholas and oh. Christopher, my 10-year-old, was there. And he ran, he thought I was bit by a shark. Oh, jeez. So he was running down the beach, 
pretty randomly. And this, well, what are we now? Uh, September 3rd, so this was two, three weeks ago now. Yeah, it was the 18th. It was August wow. 18th. Wow. And, uh, you know, from there it was, you know, I st the feelings started coming back. Oh. And, um, you know, what it was is, is the spinal cord is damaged, and then it either comes back or it doesn't come back. It's kind of a, it's very dicey. Wow. And it came back, as I could start feeling, you know, the rest of my body, uh, yeah. probably 20, 30 minutes. And then when I went back in the ambulance, I really started feeling, you know, the rest, wow. the rest of my body. And then when I got there, the only thing was my arms were, uh, I wasn't feeling much or I was feeling like this pain thing. Wow. So, I don't want to get. I don't yeah. get too much. Uh, yeah. My point is, you started out in in kind of rural Midwest town, more or less suburban right. rural, and you go to school. You're athletic. You're doing gymnastics. Yep. You decide, and and we'll get into it a little bit with your with your family against, I guess, more or less their wishes. Sure. Yeah. You're never going to do this. You're going off yeah. to the big city. <laughs> Who do you think you are? You go out there. You had this brilliant career. I don't know if we have. Um, Hopefully the sound won't come up because it's got, but if we have some of these, um, uh, we'll just run some of those, but these are some of the ads that you'd appear in, the absolute height of the modeling world. And then, and then after that, as you left the modeling world, you became a contractor mm -hmm. doing construction, doing carpentry and that kind of thing. So this neck injury, and then, and then after that, you started being a writer, but first you went back to college, right? You got your right. master's and- I got my degree in English literature in at English Boston Church. University. Okay. Uh, my intention was to write and, uh, and, and then also go to law school. I skipped the law school and did start to write after college, but then it, it started to become you know, obvious that you know, you're gonna have to do other things as well. Yeah. And then those other things just took up more and more time. Okay, but now with this injury, yeah. your writing career becomes even more important. It becomes more important, yeah. And, and, and I believe you know, that it, from what I've heard from people that it's a, it's a good thing for me to do. Uh -huh. And I think I have a lot to say. And you know, the story, some people have said they're inspired by it. And uh, you know, I think I have a style that draws people in because yeah. I try to be as honest as possible. Um, so, you know, I'm super excited to really, as, as I've said to other people, you know, dedicate myself to reading and writing uh -huh. is basically, uh, is basically what I want to do. And, um, you know, it's a t I, I did an interview for a magazine and uh, he ended with a, a quote from Mark Twain that I paraphrased and he said, if, if you don't find any books that you like, try writing one. So. That was one of the motivations to write 19 because that was true. There was not a lot of books that I was really like liking that have been written in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Wow. And uh, so I wanted to, you know, you know, give a try, bringing, you know, a lot of the, the, sort of the imagery coming from books that I'd read that were written 50, 60 years ago, yeah. and putting that with the modern, you know, with the modern uh, feel to it, a modern story. Uh, even though it's 1982, I think it's very current. The sure. things that he's going through, we're going through now. The pressures that existed in the business, they're still here now, today. And and it's it's um, one of the reasons why the the book is somewhat controversial within the modeling field, even now, with some of the people that have uh, that have read it, because it's it's honest. It's gonna it's not gonna you know just tell the story. Uh, of what people think it is, it, it tells the story of, of the way it really is. Yeah. Even though it's fiction, you know, you could compare it to, you know, I wouldn't compare it to like the jungle or, you know, uh, Animal Farm, but it, it, there's a story in there that, you know, some people probably would be better off with, okay, let's just, let's just leave that alone. And the sequel gets even more into that. It, it's not an agenda, it's just with a, with a desire to be honest, um, which I think is so important in good writing. Well, one of the things you talk about a little bit, and it's interesting because, well, I mean, this is autobiographical uh, by nature, but sure. it, it seemed like there was, a, there was a prevailing sort of conflict between being noticed, having attention, being visible, fame, and acknowledgement versus this being alone, ignored, invisible, and not acknowledged. Right. And, and there was sort of this yearning in in your heart that you wanted to be acknowledged you had this you had this uh, um, uh, you know you're handsome and so it's like okay <laughs> we can do modeling but at the same time it's like 
hey, I'm not just, you can't just put clothes on me and start clicking cameras. I've got something to say. Right. And, uh, and you talk about it, you said, um, it says, as, uh, as I grew up in a home that taught me to not trust anything or anyone, anything that was good or exciting or pleasurable was either a lie or very temporary, leaving me lower than I had started. Uh, I feel I feel anything, I'm sorry, to feel anything in my family was to feel pain and misery and there was no ha happiness and very little hope. I grew up learning to expect nothing from my family or from my life, so I eventually learned to never experience disappointment, only a low-grade sadness tempered with strong doses of indifference. This colored everything I experienced from a very young age. Right. So you get real, real into you know, what you were going through. This isn't just like, right. hey, a handsome cover and a guy, you know, talking about cocaine adult parties and right. the upper echelons of modeling in the New York and, and Milan. This really gets into the journey that you took right. and, and how it was manifested through these various chapters of your life. Right, well, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a very good section that you chose to read from. And I think that that did temper my life and the you know the the hero of the book uh, with the same name but different last name Daryl McIlvain, uh -huh. and, and I think that his his perceptions are what a lot of people uh, go through. I don't think it was a completely solo uh, that he was living in a vacuum, uh -huh. but he wanted some he wanted something more. Or, you know, I, I for lack of you know I wanted something more, something something different, and uh, you know it came from you know, a conflicted, you know, home life and a lot of things that were going on that were not typical and then you just didn't feel safe. And the... the well, what, well, what was that? I mean, yeah. we talk, you, there, like for example, when you were cut as a child, if you fell off your bike yeah. and cut your chin, <laughs> you, your parents, because of their religious beliefs, being Christian scientists, would not have you get stitches right. or take you to the doctor. Now, is it oversimplifying? Because I grew up <laughs> in a religious home myself yeah. And sometimes it's oversimplifying to say, oh, wow, you know, I had a conservative upbringing and that's what kind of caused me this great pain. But right. how did that affect you? Well, you know, I, I think you could take it both ways. I, I think when it, it, some ways that the religion was expressed to me, I thought were amazing. And I went to a great camp um, that uh, really taught more about it. So I have a lot of uh, really fond memories and, and love about it. But there's, as in everything, there's people's interpretation of any religion can can go to the extreme, uh -huh. and uh, I think a lot of people maybe you know you see the things on TV and you know Law and Order had a couple of episodes where there was you know with a Christian Science family and things like that uh -huh. that there are some people that could take it to extremes. Um, but was that the genesis of this low-grade sadness no, that you no, talked no, about? No, no, no. I think it was, was just, that a, just an aloof just an father, overall, overbearing. Uh, just what? an overall, just a lack of, you know, an extreme lack of support. It's an uh -huh. extreme lack of, you know, wanting people to be individuals. Uh, you know, um, um, you could probably come up with lots of examples of just, you know, you know, bad parenting 101 that that influenced me and basically my reaction to it was to just spend as much time as I could alone even as a, a pretty little kid uh -huh. so and that's why I have a, a part in there when I was alone I was safe when I was alone I could think or do yeah. whatever I wanted to do and not feel stupid or crazy and that's really the genesis of a, of a later uh, interpretation of life which in some ways it's good but in some ways it's bad because the hero is protected because he's not influenced by people saying, hey, if you want to be my friend, you got to do this. Or if you want to be a, a team player, you got to do that. Yeah. Which I think is a really important message that I pass on to my kids that probably if you tell people, hey, I'm not going to do that just because you're pressuring me, uh, there's a good chance that they're going to make fun of you. Not, yeah. not say, oh, you're the, you're the coolest guy in the school. Uh, yeah, yeah. So for me, that was also a big part of it growing up in a religion that a lot of people didn't have is everybody in the school knew that. And it, you know, if you can think of a minority, you're definitely a minority. Yeah. Because it was a lack of understanding and uh, you know, even things like, uh, even shots, you know, getting, getting your immunizations. We never got immunized. Wow. Well, everybody knew at school because you're the one standing out of the line. Okay. So there was, that, was, that was sort of an isolation there. But in a way, it sort of strengthened me mm -hmm. because I wasn't, uh, as I became an adult, there was no one that could have me do anything that I didn't want to do, which I think is 
an incredibly important message, especially now with the whole peer pressure thing, the social media, people doing things that they would never do just to be popular, just to get likes or, you know, likes on that. Yeah. And I, th I think it's really important that, that kids realize that what they think is the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. You know, if they think it's right, stick with it. You okay. know, don't, don't, don't fall into peer pressure. So I think I was lucky in some respects to mm -hmm. have that upbringing because I think it made me self-reliant. Okay. Um, but they did, you know, they did provide, you know, the, to the best that they could. The one thing that I didn't like was, or that I found lacking was this sort of support, you mm -hmm. know, the support system. Yeah. Like my friend, you know, it just seemed, it seemed like something natural to other families. So when you come out to your family and say, hey, guess what? And by the way, one, one of the conflicts you've had, and you talk about it, it said, I found that everyone thought of me as handsome, as a handsome slacker that relied <laughs> on his looks instead of his brains. It was inconceivable to them that I was a very smart young man and just happened to be good looking. Uh, is that, you know, you're not going to have anyone you know, shed a tear for you, you know, because you're a handsome guy and in some of these pictures as we hopefully were scrolling Back in the through day, right? those. But um, did you find that? Did you find that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I was handsome, but people didn't respect me. And I, there, there was this yearning of the character in the book anyways, the sense that I, I wanted to make it on my own. I wanted to make a statement. I wanted to be considered relevant above and beyond just, you know, looking good and smiling at a camera. Right. Well, I wanted to be seen as the whole person and not, mm -hmm. not as a two-dimensional. Uh, and as I, got old, as I got older, actually in a very short period of time, probably uh -huh. from 17 to, to 19, everything changed because I was, went from being really extremely thin to, you know, as, as boys do, you, you gain yeah. a little bit of weight. And that, that changed the dynamic there uh, with pretty much everything. Um, but in the beginning, I didn't mind it. But as it went on and on, it got a little bit old. Where people uh -huh. would just say, you know, you're not here to think. You're, you're not. We didn't ask for your opinion. You're just here to, you know, wear clothes and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was fairly outspoken, you know, right from the beginning. Well, that okay. So then, then as we move forward in the book, you come to New York City, and you're you're beginning to break into an incredibly competitive right. modeling business. You had you had no you know inside track. You had no references. You had no anything. Right. And uh, walk us through the character and how that that went on. Going to these calls, going to these various you know um, shoots. Well, I mean, I get, once I got with an agency, they immediately sent me to you know a few photographers. And the first photographer I ever went to was you know a little bit lecherous, you know, and he was yeah. you know trying to get you know, these uh, sort of bizarre shots and, uh, you know, you can read about it in, in, the, bu in the book mm -hmm. of how, you know, he handled it slash I handled it. And the other photographers were great. But um, once I sort of, you know, got through that, you know, uh, uh, experience, once I got over to Italy, things were pretty awesome. There was a, a great yeah. photographer, and but even in Italy, yeah. it was like it was like the you know big leagues yeah. of backbiting and yep. Darwinian survival of the fittest yeah. and egos galore. But yeah. there were all some very pretty girls and pools and <laughs> hotels and things like that. This book is not exactly what you might call G P G. Uh, no, they, yeah, no, it's like PG thirteen or you know R maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely it's definitely up there with you know, you know, uh, uh, coming of age books yeah. um, um, out there. But the, the main thing that I wanted to do is make it real and believable and, uh, you know, draw from real experience. And, uh, uh, you know, when I first wrote it, I started writing it for, oh, what's going to be sensational and what are people going to like? And I found that I didn't like it. And I went back and, you know, like a, a, the first hundred pages, I just got rid of it. Okay. I just started with, you know, what was you know, what was actually going on in his head and what he was observing. And I, and I just tried to be totally honest about it. And um, at first I found it very limiting and tough to stay inside his head uh -huh. because you don't know anything unless he knows it. And But then I found it kind of liberating because he can create his own world. Someone that did a review said, you know, he creates a world real and imagined because yeah. In all honesty, any world that we believe is there, that's really our interpretation. You could have two people, like you and I could be sitting right here and 
what you think is going on could be totally different yeah. than what I think is going on, well, I, and we're both right. I love a couple, a couple, <laughs> you know, scenes in my head or, or passages in the book. One was where you st you lived, or the the character in the book lived in this like just walk up seedy apartment in inside a house near the railroad tracks in Westport, and how you you know you were just scrimping to get by. Yeah. You'd go to the train, and there'd be like these. Maseratis and Lamborghinis yep. going by, and you're like, is this ever going to work? You schlub down to Manhattan in the cold, and you're trying to break in. Then you get the big break. You go to you go to Italy, but still, it's not like you're in the lap of luxury. No. But the character in the book would come home and leave this hotel, this pension, and there would be a phalanx of prostitutes right. in front who you befriended, or the per the, <laughs> the character befriended. And what yeah. was that like? Well, it was it was kind of interesting because. Um, you know, it, it told me something about myself and the character that he really doesn't care. He really, he really is not going around judging people based on what they're doing. He's like, they're doing something, I'm doing something. Yeah. And um, you weren't to the manner born and above. You know, right, uh, right. all this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it, the old the old saying that you know um, you're not better than anybody else, but yeah. nobody's better than you. So you know, sort of like we're all equal. Um, but he, he found benefits to staying at, at this pension was that nobody really bothered him. You know, yeah. nobody was like, "Hey, what time did you come in?" or check, you know, checking up. And he, you know, he sort of uh, appreciated that yeah. and felt a sense of comfort in a place where a lot of people were, "Wow, this place is pretty," you know, you know, kind of a, a scary place. But um, you know, I, fa I found it, you know, it was home the whole time I was there. I never, I never uh, left uh, that pension. One of the prevailing themes in the book was talking about finding happiness. Right. You know, wh where did you find happiness? And, and, and just talked about uh, um, the disappointment. He says, I knew that without, uh, without asking that mom would never, I'm sorry, I knew without asking that mom would never take me to a doctor to get stitches no matter how bad my coat was. He talked about that. From that point, I knew I could not count on pain or disappointment to be a big part of my life. Happiness became a fairy tale, a unicorn that did not exist. It was something I decided to stop chasing when I was 10 years old, leaving me to live uh, cold and alone within my mind. I watched the world from a place that was mine alone, a place unreachable by those who thought they knew me. Um, that's pretty tough stuff. Right. And it seemed like this illusion of happiness was always just a little bit outside your grasp. Did you ever find it? Is there any resolution here? Is there any you know? uh, Sure. Well, I think I'm I think I'm pretty happy now, but you know, especially based on some of the curveballs that have been thrown me in life and certainly well, anyone that can like kids, yeah, land on your neck be paralyzed <laughs> and come away you know with I think a, I was cracking jokes you know like uh, I don't want to you know get me up on the beach and then drown because a wave comes in so yeah why don't you guys take me up a little bit we'll worry about the back later but yeah yeah you know um, I think it, it, just the amount of kids that I have uh, it, it I don't take myself as seriously I think that at that time there was a lot of stuff going on, and uh -huh. the, the things that uh, um, that I really liked are the things that I still like, which don't really cost any money, which is reading and writing. Yeah. Uh, it gives me happiness, and you know, just just talking to my to my children. I actually enjoy that. I'm not sure if a lot of people enjoy that more than doing stuff, but I really enjoy talking to them. And it's just, funny. I'm sort of an empty nester now, and I enjoy talking to my kids more. Not that you know they're they're outside my house a little bit. The book again is 19. Caller, have you re have you read this book yet, caller? Not yet. I wrote you it down, and uh, I'll see if the bookstore will order it. Yeah, I mean, well, I know we're non-commercial television here, but if a guy goes on Amazon <laughs> or if you just Google Daryl Janey. Daryl, uh, J-A-N-N-E-Y, -N -N -E just Google it, like five different stuff comes up. All these uh, pictures we're showing you comes up, and he has this uh, special thing he's doing to get prepared to write his second book. You might want to look into that too. But So you promise you're going to go out and buy this book? <laughs> I, I will promise, and the guest that, that was on before with the one on Islam, I'm also in the process of getting that one. So Jeez, we're, we're please moving please. books around here. We're like Oprah. This is good. Okay, uh, uh, Mitsubishi Miyashita for everyone. Okay, sorry. The keys are under your seat. Just kidding. Marty, you do a great job. Come on. I want to ask your guest.
guess a, a question though, because right, he's. I look at him and and from what he says, and he is expressing himself through the writings, and that's why I really would like to read the book because I'd like to see him through this book. How does he use himself as a filter to reflect his things on life to his own children? I'd be interested to know. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Like, I mean, th this book is autobiographical to a point. Right. You know, you're expressing your views, your opinion, your perspective. Um, how do you see that through your kids? I mean, frankly, you know, a guy holding down a job, paying his rent or mortgage, gas, groceries, and taking care of seven kids, for many people, right. this is enough. <laughs> this whole Ernest Hemingway concept on the on top of all that seems Ernest a bit much. Hemingway. But how do, you, how do you manage it all, and how do you see your expression through your kids? Well, I mean, the one thing that I've done uh, with, uh, you know, Nicholas is the one that saved me. He's 15, and he's, we talk pretty much every morning, and we talk every night. We talk about pretty much everything, uh -huh. and when he was very, all the kids when they're young, I try to tell them stuff that maybe is not typical conversation, because I think the only way to prepare them is so that they have the knowledge to make their own decisions. I'm not a, a helicopter parent. I don't check their phones. I know a lot of people say you should check their phones, you should check, you know, because it really, anybody can do anything if they're away from you for 10 minutes. Yeah. So my logic, Well, you lived that. You yeah. hightailed it out of Illinois, yeah. <laughs> you came to Westport, then Manhattan, then Milan, and you were well, I was, in the Yeah, big but way. I was a good kid. I was probably one of their least troublesome kids. I mean, I never had any uh, any uh, police officers come into the house for uh -huh. me, where my brothers did. So I oh, really? The, I was the one that was, you know, not a problem, that okay. they weren't worried about. Uh -huh. My only thing was I wanted, I, I was the only one that actually left. Uh, so I don't know if that answers uh, your caller's question, yeah. but that's... Uh, you know, I think the talking to, to your kids, to my kids, you know, I, I don't really have any agenda of like how you should or shouldn't. Uh -huh. Just talking to them, I think, is really important. I think uh, one of the uh, guys on Saturday Night Live, the the Frank uh, Al Franken, gave mm -hmm. a gave a, a commencement speech at uh, Harvard, and he said he said it was baloney that kids want to spend quality time with their parents. Yeah. He said they want to spend lots of lousy, low quality time, just lots of time with their parents rather than this wow. quality time. And I totally agree with him. I absolutely agree that they yeah. just want to, this, these nothing moments where nothing's going on, that's when they want to look over and see you there or playing Uno with my five-year-old who thinks he's like an Uno champ and yeah, yeah. won't play because I don't let him win enough. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's probably true, that quality time thing. Listen, the book is 19. Uh, I'm telling you, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, he's, on, he's starting uh, his next book. If you, if you just Google Daryl Janey, it'll come up. Every, the internet blows up. He's got uh, some things he's putting together to uh, put together this next book. You'll want to look up that and, and get this book. It's really, uh, you won't be able to put it down. At least I wasn't able to. And it's a fascinating awesome. look. It isn't just, you know, another pretty face, another, you know, modeling book kind of thing. He really gets into the depths of the soul, what it, what it means to pursue your goals. And it's, it, it isn't black and white. There's all kinds of gray areas as he navigates that and goes through it. it I found it a very, very interesting book, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to his next book. So listen, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate it very much, and good luck with your neck. And uh, you know, <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Stay out of the surf and, right. and, get, and give me a give me a copy of the new book when it comes out too. Will do. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, Marty.